Next panel, um, I'm Darren Bush. I'm a law professor at the University of Houston Law Center, and I'm a double alum of the U University of Utah in economics and, uh, and law. Um, don't hold that against me. Um, the purpose of this panel is to discuss the goals of antitrust, and if when we're teaching a statutory interpretation course, and I highly suggest you do, um, or perhaps suffering through one if you're a law student, the first place we might look for a purpose to the statute is the text itself. After all, as Justice Kagan said, we're all textualists now, although I don't think she perhaps means that the way that Justice Scalia did. Um, but interpreting statu antitrust statutes is frequently assumed in a, uh, an ambiguous statute, and thus as, uh, we've turned to the legislative history to try to discern what that statute means. Uh, the most famous interpretation stems from Robert Bork, who viewed the goals of antitrust as to maximize consumer welfare. And so that notion of, of the goal of antitrust, Bork's version of consumer welfare, has dominated, an, dominated antitrust for about 50 years. And many have pushed back by ex, uh, examination of the legislative history in a different light. However, Bork's view remains the dominant view as to the purpose of antitrust law today. Professor Mark Glick and Professor Gabriel Lozada from the Economics Department will be presenting a, a paper today as to why that notion of consumer welfare is fundamentally flawed, even on its own terms. The paper they present today is titled, Why Economists Should Support Populist Antitrust Goals. Um, as I mentioned, antitrust is strange in the sense that a battle over legislative history, if you are being, uh, interpreting a text, is not the place you would ordinarily start. Indeed, Justice Scalia frequently used legislative history just to mock legislative history's usefulness. Um, so uh, Professor Land, Bob Land, from the University of Baltimore School of Law, uh, takes on the textualist saber and, and makes a textualist case for stronger antitrust enforcement, and why doing so would lead to quite different goals from antitrust than consumer welfare theory disciples would perhaps advocate. Judge Robert Shelby has, a, has been a district judge in the District of Utah since 2012 and chief judge since 2018. And he will rule on whether Professor Land's argument <laughs> makes sense and would in practice. And whether or not uh, Land's argument has any, that's right, appeal to a judge on the ground. Um, I brought my toothbrush in case you wanted to hold me in contempt for that pun. Um, <laughs> Finally, uh, last but not least, we we'll finish up with Susan Athey, Chief Economist at the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Prior to joining the DOJ, she was the Economics of Technology Professor at, at Stanford uh, Graduate School of Business, where I presume she might return at some point, uh, um, but not too soon. Right. Um, her remarks will focus on big tech in relation to the goals of antitrust, a driving theme of antitrust enforcement of late, and the launching pad for many of the legal and economic issues discussed on this panel. And I'm here as your ruthless moderator, and uh, I will, we will start with Professor Glick Lozada. Okay. Um, the consumer welfare standard may be losing some support recently among antitrust scholars and pr practitioners. It may even be on life support to some extent, but it's definitely not dead. Some still think that it's flexible enough to support antitrust reforms or that there's little downside from retaining it. But we disagree. The consumer welfare standard is simply unfit to be a standard for antitrust policy and it should be completely abandoned. We have three reasons why the consumer welfare standard cannot be used to decide the proper goals of antitrust policy. First, it a priori excludes any goals that can't be measured by demand and price. Therefore, it's useless as a guide for evaluating antitrust goals. Second, by its nature and its, assumption, its assumptions, it's biased in favor of big business and the rich. And third, it's an inconsistent theory. And because of its flaws, it has been abandoned by modern welfare economists. Okay, I'll discuss 
why the consumer welfare standard is too narrow, and Professor Lozada will discuss bias and inconsistency. Okay, so why is the consumer welfare standard too narrow? Um, in order to explain this conclusion, I got to start with a couple of factual premises, and, and those should be up, up on the screen. First, in economics, the term welfare means human well-being. It doesn't mean economic growth. Welfare is what makes life worth living from the point of view of the individuals that are living that life. Second, the consumer welfare standard is simply Alfred Marshall's theory of consumer surplus from his 1890 Principles of Economics. We teach this theory in every introductory microeconomics class in our department. Alfred Marshall was part of the, what's called the material welfare school. He divided welfare into two parts. The first part are things that affect well-being that can be measured by demand and price. He called this economic welfare. Examples are, for example, uh, lower prices, better products, more income, et cetera. The second part of welfare for Marshall involves factors that impact well-being but can't be directly, uh, don't directly impact demand and price. He called this non-economic welfare. And examples include what we call today quality of life factors like political democracy, inequality, health, et cetera. All right, two more important points. In 1890, Marshall could not measure the quality of life factors. But today we can. There are major ongoing studies around the world by economists measuring the quality of life. Second, Marshall never thought that policy should exclude non-economic welfare. He, he just said he couldn't measure it. In his lifetime, for example, he tried to influence British policy to address all kinds of quality of life issues, including the fate of orphans in Britain. All right, now to antitrust. Judge Bork, in the antitrust paradox, introduced Marshall's theory and just renamed it the consumer welfare standard. His explicit goal, and he explained this in his Yale Law Journal article, was to eliminate what he referred to as value judgments from antitrust. And by that he meant the traditional congressional antitrust goals of political democracy and protection of small business. All right, so how did he do it? He simply argued that if Marshall's theory, now called consumer, the consumer welfare standard, can't measure the goal, then it can't be objective and it must be dropped. Problem is, well, you see the trick, right? The problem is the quality of life factors can be measured, just not with Marshall's theory. And second, Marshall himself thought that the policy should include quality of life factors, even if he couldn't measure it. So look at slide two. Slide two lists uh, some of the goals of antitrust. So you have, I can't really see it well, but you, you have lower prices, product quality, and to a lesser extent, innovation. Those are the consumer welfare standard um, endorsed goals. Then there's the traditional goals of antitrust that, you know, that are pre rankwist you know, justices pre rankwist talked about and congressional uh, intent um, of the Sherman Act and of the, of the Clayton Act, um, it, where, where those goals are explicit. And then there are new goals suggested by many recently, in, including protection of labor, inequality, and to a lesser extent, sustainability sustainability more so in Europe. All right, now apply Bork's trick. Just claim that the only goals that can be measured by Marshall's theory are legitimate. So now I'll just regroup them. And you see goals that can be measured by Marshall's theory, it's the traditional goals plus labor because there's labor surplus. You can measure labor surplus. So, but all the others a priori are excluded. You can't use the theory to discuss it. They're just excluded, you know, by nature. So all the other goals that are excluded, and they're not, and it's not because the goals are not important. It's not because competition policy can't impact these factors. It's not because we can't measure them today. It's solely because they can't be measured by one particular economic theory. And that's why the consumer welfare standard has to go. So now let's take a closer look at the economics behind Judge Bork's consumer welfare standard example. 
to set the stage, we have an output market, uh, price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal, a demand curve called the Marshallian demand curve. The price is P1, the quantity is Q1. Here I've assumed constant average cost, so the average and margin cost curve are both horizontal. I'm assuming perfect competition. Total revenue equals total cost here, so there's no profit. Consumer surplus is the area above the price line and below the demand curve. So that's what society, that's a measure of society's benefit for producing this Q1 units of output. And total cost is the area under KG, which doesn't give society any net benefit. It's part of a gross idea of consumer surplus, but consumers have to pay for it. So that nets out. But, um, and, and so the idea in the output market is that the total cost area doesn't contribute to net social surplus. But there's an input market also, which we shouldn't forget. So here's a, an input supply curve, SI, an input price, PI1, an input quantity, I1. The area above the supply curve and below the price of the input is the economic rent to the input supplier, which is just as much a contribution to social welfare as consumer surplus is. And the area below the supply curve is the opportunity cost to the input supplier. And the entire rectangle is this total cost area that we saw in the previous graph. So actually, some of that total cost area does contribute to social welfare. It's a net contributor to social welfare. So here's the figure from Bork's antitrust paradox at the beginning of chapter five. What happens if there's a merger? So we're going to assume that one of the things that occurs with the merger is that costs fall. So average costs fall from AC1 down to AC2. In addition, the marginal cost changes to, uh, to the marginal, I mean, the marginal revenue curve changes, as I've indicated there. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost at point I, which determines the new monopoly quantity Q2. So quantity falls quite a bit from Q1 to Q2. Given Q2, the market clearing price is determined by the Marshallian demand curve at point A. So P2 is the new price. So you have a large increase in price. So that's the positive analysis. What happens? Q falls, P rises. What about the welfare analysis? So the normative analysis is on this next slide. The, again, the standard textbook social criterion is total surplus. We don't care how surplus is distributed. That's the, that's the mantra. So the colored areas are changes in surplus coming about from the merger. Yeah, this goes back to Williamson American Economic Review, 1968. So, so color by color, green is good. So the green represents the decrease in cost that comes about because of the merger. So that's a, a good thing. Now, often it's in the, the antitrust literature, these called efficiencies. That's not a good practice. And, and at least I, as an economist, won't engage in it because in economics, there are two kinds of efficiency, Pareto efficiency and potential Pareto efficiency. And this is neither one of those. So just to clarify terms, I'm going to use cost saving because, because it's cost saving. It's not any of the other kind of efficiencies that economists talk about. Um, th that economic theorists talk about, let's say. Now, the, the, the next area is blue. That's neutral. So that's a transfer from firm to firm, to firms from consumers. It used to be part of consumer surplus, but now it's part of profit. And in this theory, since distribution is irrelevant, only the total matters. This doesn't change the total. And so this doesn't affect anything. And so it's welfare neutral. And then the bad area is the red area. You have a quantity fall from Q1 to Q2. So output that used to generate welfare doesn't, doesn't exist anymore because the monopolist isn't producing it. That causes a deadweight loss. Some of the green and the blue is firm profit. So before, firms making, weren't making any profit. Now they're making a lot of profit. And using the social criterion, monopolization is good if and only if the green area is larger than the red area. So that's the standard textbook analysis. And what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is explain that the analysis of the green area isn't right, the analysis of the blue area isn't right, and the analysis of the red area isn't right. So let's do the green area first. From the, here's the CWS uh, measure of merger cost savings to view from the input market. And let's say this is, there's only one input just to make things simple. 
So you, and now I drew demand for the input. Demand for the input falls. So the old demand was di1. The old equilibrium point was n. New demand is di2. The new equilibrium point is w. I'm drawing a competitive market. I'm not assuming monopsony. You could if you want to. You could, you could add imperfect competition here. But this is a competitive market. Um, you have a rising supply curve. The firm doesn't know the supply curve is rising. The firm takes prices, the input price is given, um, but, uh, but the market supply curve is rising. The previous total cost is the rectangle under MN. The new total cost is the rectangle under TW. The difference between the old rectangle and the new rectangle is the cost savings, the total cost savings. Total cost savings can be split up into two parts, savings due to the fall in output, and savings due to the fall in average cost. Let's let the green area be the savings due to the fall in average cost. So the green area equals the cost savings rectangle from the previous slide. The standard textbook analysis has this as being the end of the story. The, what we have in the input market is this green area, and it's a good thing. Oh, really? You've also got a loss in rent. The red area here is the rent that the input suppliers have lost. That's a net loss to society and ought to be taken into account. Ignoring that is simply a mistake. So this bias against input suppliers, as I say, occurs even if the input market is competitive. The, the true social wealth, so, uh, gains in social welfare here is the green area minus the red area. So next, let's do the blue area. Bias number one, the CWS rates the rich weights the rich more since they have more surplus. All that counts for the CWS is the total amount of surplus, not its distribution. Surplus is measured in dollars. So the CWS holds dollar transfers to be welfare neutral. That's why you said the blue area was, was neutral. But rich pe richer people have more surplus than poor people because their effective demand is higher because their income is higher. So CWS policies weight them more, so CWS policies are biased in favor of the rich. The CWS neutrality, then, is just a formal neutrality, like the famous quote from Anatoly France about the majestic equality of the law, which forbids rich and poor alike from sleeping under bridges, begging in streets, and stealing loaves of bread. Furthermore, repeated application of the CWS causes ever more inequality. Because when you do it once, that benefits the rich, and so the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poorer. So the next time, it exacerbates things. It gets worse and worse. CWS then, in practice, is plutocratic. It's an actual road to serfdom, if you get the reference to Hayek's book. CWS bias number two. Again, all that counts is the total amount of the surplus, not its distribution. So dollar transfers are supposed to be welfare neutral. And the blue areas have no welfare effects. In particular, CWS considers $1 of surplus transferred from a poor person to a rich person to be welfare neutral. But nobody else thinks that. Almost everybody thinks this CWS assumption is wrong. And it's said that additional income to a rich person increases either their individual utility or the social welfare less than additional income to the poor person. And the paper has quotations from philosophers, from the Hebrew Bible, uh, even from economists. Indeed, Alfred Marshall agreed, feeling the total surplus was an appropriate goal only when the policy affected large groups of people well balanced between rich and poor. Third problem, if you really think about it, the CWS is actually bizarre. Again, all that counts is total surplus, not its distribution. Suppose a buyer and a seller agree on a sale. The welfare effect of the transfer of the good is that it increases surplus. That's why they agreed. The welfare effect of the payment, well, it's a transfer of dollars, which the CWS says is welfare neutral because dollars are the numeraire. Hence, a theft by the buyer of this item is, according to CWS, just as good as its voluntary sale because the only difference between the theft and the purchase is wealth, the welfare neutral transfer of a numeraire. This is... It, it, this is the potential Pareto criterion. The idea is that people will consent to four in virtue of its potential to be one. Does that make any sense? I mean, uh, Jules Coleman was writing in 1980 that, that this actually, this is bizarre. 
Now, the more economic part of my talk here is the inconsistency, the red area, that consumer surplus area. The CWS measure of debt losses is the loss in consumer surplus. But we've known since the new welfare economics of 1941, two decades before Bork, that consumer surplus is not a correct measure of value. The new welfare economics replaced consumer surplus with compensating variation, CV, and equivalent variation, EV, or the equivalent ideas of willingness and ability to pay and willingness to accept. So neoclassical value is not singular. It's not one number. It's binary. It's two numbers. Angus Deaton, and I'll use asterisks to denote people who won the Nobel Prize in economics, concluded in 1995 that there is no valid theoretical or practical reason for ever integrating under a Marshallian demand curve. That means forever calculating consumer surplus. Willick showed this in this famous paper in 1976. This was his figure. Now, let's turn it back to, to our figure. So the right way to do deadweight loss is to draw in what are called Hicksian demand curves. I've dashed them here, DHA and DHG, one through the initial point and one through the final point. And so the correct areas of deadweight loss are one I drew here in pink and the other I drew in orange. So we have two actual deadweight loss areas, one for equivalent variation, EV, or willingness to pay, and one for CV, or willingness to accept. With two different measures of merger deadweight loss, what can go wrong? Well, if the cost savings are less than both measures, then there's no problem. Then the deadweight loss is bigger than the cost savings, the merger shouldn't go through. And if the cost savings is, are, is bigger than both measures of deadweight loss, then there's no problem either. Uh, cost savings are higher than deadweight loss, so the merger should go through. But what happens if the cost savings fall in the middle? Then according to one valid measure, you should, you should allow the merger, and according to the other valid measure, you shouldn't. So if the cost savings fall in the gap between the two measures of deadweight loss, what do you do? The Caldor criterion, which uses uh, which is a CV compensating variation, says, if currently you're not merged, don't merge. But if currently you're merged, you should stay merged. Well, what's better, merger or not? So this is inconsistent. And the inconsistency there is, uh, gives rise to one of the words in our title. The Higgs criterion, which uses equivalent variation, is even stranger. It says, if currently not merged, merge. And if currently merged, divest. So this generates a cycle, merge, divest, merge, divest, merge, divest. That's a nutty way of doing public policy. Nobody would do that. So how big is the gap between the two measures? Because if the gap is big, then there's a greater chance that the cost savings fall inside the gap and you've got a problem. Well, let's go back to Willick's paper. If eta here is the income elasticity, delta CS is the change in consumer surplus, uh, M is income, and you use these numbers, which Willick's table one has, then the difference between the EV day weight loss and the CV day weight loss as a fraction of the change in consumer surplus is 97.7%. That is not a small number. Lots of people, when they read Willick's paper, because he wrote it this way, uh, come, with, come, out, come with the impression that there's not much difference between EV and CV. But even his table shows that that's not necessarily the case. So how do we conclude? The CWS is narrow, biased against the poor, and incorrect. The CVEV, or Caldor-Hicks approach, is narrow, biased against the poor, and sometimes inconsistent. There are other problems that the paper talks about. There's the Broadway paradox from the 1970s, numeraire non-neutrality, which is even worse. Chipman and Moore, economic theorists, writing back in 1978 in the International Economic Review, judge in relation to its basic objective of enabling economists to make welfare prescriptions without having to make value judgments. So you remember Mark Glick talked about the desire not to make value judgments. So that's the idea. Can we not make value judgments? Okay. So judge in relation to that objective, the new welfare economics must be considered a failure. And indeed, if you look at what actual welfare economists have been writing about, they have not been writing about Caldor Hicks since the early 1980s. The way forward, policy prescriptions always contain value judgments. Be self-aware and transparent about the ones you use. You, in the antitrust context, use value judgments that motivated Congress 
or value the factors which rigorous social science research shows affect well-being. Use a consistent approach. Either a Bergson Samuelson social welfare function, this is not new, Bergson was writing in the 1930s, or a Marty Sen's capabilities approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was excellent. And uh, I bet you all are now really looking forward to statutory interpretation too. Um, economic statutory interpretations panel's awesome. Uh, so Bob Land starts off next. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Great, great. Um, I'm actually gonna talk about two Roaring Twenties antitrust topics. Since I've only got limited time, I'll just spend a few minutes on each, and I'll have to save the complexities and details for the written material. Um, my first topic is, as Darren said, using textualism to guide antitrust, which sometimes will mean that the antitrust statutes will be interpreted according to these laws, very consumer-oriented original language. And as my example, I'll try to convince you that this would mean that Section 2 of the Sherman Act is actually a no-fault statute, a statute that does not require anti-competitive conduct for the imposition of sanctions on monopolies and firms that attempt to monopolize. Uh, defendants um, don't have to engage in anti-competitive conduct to be sanctioned under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. The, section, the second Roaring Twenties approach to antitrust that I'm going to try to convince you of is that it is sometimes possible to explicitly incorporate political considerations into antitrust decision making and to do it very well in a clear, objective, and predictable manner. And my example will be pure conglomerate merger legislation. My co-author Sandeep Vahisen and I suggest that for political reasons, we should enact a statute that would ban all mergers above a very clearly specified dollar limit. We suggest $10 billion for both, or maybe the correct word is each, of the merging firms without inquiring into the economics involved. Interestingly, Senator Josh Hawley recently introduced a bill containing a variation of this approach, except that his limitation would kick in at $100 billion for either firm. But let me start with textualism and no-fault monopolization. Even five years ago, the textualist approach to statutory interpretation was almost the exclusive provision of Judge Scalia. But today, at least five Supreme Court justices are solidly textualist. Even if, like me, you're not a textualist, you have to take it seriously today. Now, as you know, a traditionalist approach to statutory interpretation interprets laws according to their legislative history. It looks at the floor debates in Congress. It looks at the committee reports, and those inform how we interpret the law. The Chicago School idea that was referred to by my colleagues uh, that that antitrust is solely preoccupied with economic efficiency comes from Judge Bork's traditionalist, not textualist, but traditionalist analysis of the Sherman Act debates. Judge Bork went through the Sherman Act debates and finds literally dozens of examples of members of Congress saying, we don't like it when the trusts raise prices to consumers. He gives dozens of those until he convinces you that, wow, that really was their main preoccupation. That's why they passed the Sherman Act. And then comes what I think Mark called his sleight of hand. He said, well, what's wrong with raising prices to consumers? And he says, well, that causes a form of economic inefficiency we call allocative inefficiency. And he draws some of those diagrams that Gabriel uh, drew the simplified version. That was his sleight of hand. Higher prices, 
economic, it's the same as economic inefficiency. Well, none of that stuff was known certainly to members of Congress in 1890 that higher prices lead to even a fraction, even the stuff they demolished wasn't known to members of Congress in 1890, let alone any correct version. But what did Congress know in 1890? And that is the wealth transfer aspects of super competitive pricing. You can go back and find members of Congress saying, uh, the trusts are robbing the people, extorting from the people, extorting wealth from the people, stealing from the people, r robbing the farmer on the one hand and the consumer on the other hand. That sounds like a concern with the wealth transfer properties of super competitive pricing. So under this traditionalist view, the whole point of antitrust is not Bork's traditionalist view, economic efficiency, but rather preventing these wealth transfers from consumers, from purchasers, to firms with market power. Or if you want to phrase this a little bit less politely, uh, cons uh, Congress in effect gave that property right, that amorphous property right that we today call consumer surplus, and, co and Congress defined it and gave it to consumers, and then said, if you take that without compensating them, you have stolen their property, and that's why we have the antitrust laws today. So that's all, text, that's all a traditionalist analysis. A textualist would say none of that is important. Throw it all out and start over. We don't care about the legislative history at all. Instead, we go back and we find how dictionaries, especially dictionaries, also legal treatises and cases of the period, define the key terms in the statute. You look at those definitions and then you stop. All you do is interpret the key words and phrases in the plain, ordinary, straightforward language of the period. And textualists also stress that judges should not insert their own policy preferences into the statute. They should just look at the words in the statute and interpret them in the way that they were written way back in this case in 1890. Now, of course, textualism has a lot of details and a lot of complications. Uh, Justice Scalia wrote a 560-page book called Reading Law that contains these details and complications. None of them affect what I'm about to say, but there's a lot more to textualism than what I, what I just gave you, uh, obviously. So what would a textualist analysis do for Section 2 of the Sherman Act? Well, as you know, Section 2 of the Sherman Act just says it's illegal to monopolize or attempt to monopolize, blah, 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 right? That's it, okay? Nowhere does Section 2 require anti-competitive conduct for a violation. Nothing in the text suggests any exceptions, such as an exception for an efficient monopolist. So the key question to a textualist is how were terms like monopolize and attempt defined uh, when the Sherman Act was passed? Well, in his book, Justice Scalia very helpfully provides lists of dictionaries and legal treatises of the period, of the various periods, that he considered authoritative and reliable. So all we have to do is define words like monopolize according to the sources that Scalia himself has blessed. And if you do this, you will see that monopolize was defined the same way it's defined today, colloquially, not with all the baggage that judges have added to it uh, over the years. It was, it was, sorry, sorry, you're my prop, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait for one <laughs> with all the language that judges have added to it over the years. It was defined, monopolized was defined by these dictionaries as simply to obtain a monopoly, period. There was no requirement that the monopoly be obtained by anti-competitive conduct. Now, I'll just give two examples from Scalia's list because they're really boring. You don't want me to, to do that, but they're all essentially identical. The Webster's Dictionary of the period defined monopolized as to purchase or obtain possession of the whole of as a commodity of goods in the market. The Oxford English Dictionary had a similar de definition. To get into one's hands the whole stock of, to have a monopoly, to obtain exclusive possession or control. None of these old definitions required a firm to do anything wrong when it obtained its monopoly. Every firm that obtained a monopoly had monopolized, period. I also examined cases of the period, uh, but, but none of the cases uh, uh, are, are 
turn out to be relevant. What about the word attempt as it was used circa 1890, both by itself and as part of an attempted crime? Well, I checked Scalia's preferred sources, and once again, attempt was defined back then the exact same way it is today. I won't bore you by reading you those definitions. There was no anti-competitive requirement for an attempt, no exceptions for an attempt by, uh, for doing something efficient. Therefore, no exceptions should be read into, uh, into the statute by the courts. No anti-competitive requirements for an attempted monopolization violation should be read into the statute by the court. If a firm made a serious attempt to take over a market, it should be sanctioned under Section 2. Period. Now, as, as you all know, the current case law only imposes sanctions under Section 2 if a court decides the firm engaged in anti-competitive conduct. However, under a textualist approach, all this old case law was wrongly decided. It should be overturned. Now, due to my lack of time, let me just t talk for a couple more minutes about attempted monopolization, which contains a dangerous probability of success requirement. That is not in the statute. Where did that come from? Well, again, judges just made it up. It's not in the statute. And under the current case law, a firm is almost never found, no matter what, to have it successfully attempted to monopolize with less than a 50% market share. Well, isn't it possible for a, th for a firm with a 40 or 30 percent market share to seriously try to attempt a relevant market, uh, attempt, uh, attempt to monopolize a relevant market? The answer is, well, yes, yeah, sometimes it should be. And of course, there shouldn't be an anti-competitive conduct requirement for attempted monopolization cases. So in conclusion, for this part of my talk, where did the requirement that anti-competitive conduct uh, come from in Section 2 cases? It's not even hinted at in the text of the Sherman Act. Shouldn't we recognize that judges simply made up the anti-competitive conduct requirement because they thought it was good policy? Well, this is not textualism. In fact, it's the opposite of textualism. So in keeping with the theme of this conference, no-fault monopolization is a Roaring Twenties approach to antitrust. It embodies a love for competition and a distaste for monopoly that is so strong that it does not even undertake a standard econom economic analysis of the pros and cons of the particular situation. It would simply impose sanctions on all monopolies and attempt to monopolize. Now, I've also been asked to spend a few minutes talking about a second Roaring Twenties approach to antitrust, and that's a topic that, uh, that Mark and Chair Khan were talking about, and that is conglomerate mergers, which uh, apparently um, hasn't been much of a subject uh, well, for, of the antitrust world for 40 years, but according to Chair Khan, maybe, maybe coming back into uh, vogue. But first, I have a question for the audience. During a recent five-year period, there were 78 corporate mergers where both firms had more than $10 billion in assets. Each firm, both firms, however you want to word it linguistically. Both firms had more than $10 billion in assets. Of those 78 large recent mergers, how many were totally blocked by the U.S. antitrust laws? How many would guess 50 or more? How many 40 or more? How many 30 or more? Well, the answer is three. Three were totally blocked by the US antitrust laws. Um, 75 were not. Today, the largest company in the world in terms of market capitalization is Apple with, depending on what day of the week you catch them, about $2.5 trillion in market capitalization. Number two is Saudi Aramco with a little over $2 billion in market capitalization. Today. Apple could buy Saudi Aramco, and if they have any overlaps, you could spin it off. Could we throw Tesla into that? They're number six in market capitalization. I even think we could throw in Amazon and Microsoft into that. And if they have any overlaps, sure, you could get rid of the overlaps easily. Chair Khan talked about 
she kind of hemmed and hawed when you gave her basically that question and said, maybe there are some data markets we could get them on. And yes, all of these companies are in a lot of data markets. But if they're all in a lot of data markets, how are you going to show any market power in any of those data markets? I really think that I've just given you five of the largest companies in the world in terms of assets. Total assets, about $9 billion. I really think under today's antitrust laws, if they're willing to spin off overlaps, they could all merge today. This is because, as you know, the antitrust statutes are interpreted solely in economic terms in particular markets. And I think this happened for two important reasons. The first is the amorphous, unprincipled nature of most of the ways that we could incorporate political considerations into antitrust. This lack of, pro of predictability and objective, and objective I can't even pronounce it, oh, objectivity, certainly could give undue discretion to the decision makers and the courts. The second reason why the antitrust world long has believed that only economics should count is because of the belief that blocking extremely large mergers would mean the loss of significant efficiencies. Both of these reasons, however, are being questioned today. This questioning is the impetus for that paper Sandeep Vahisan and I wrote uh, on uh, con uh, proposed conglomerate merger legislation, uh, saying that all mergers should be prohibited above clearly specified dollar limits. Now, we're, of course, proposing this for political reasons. And if you look at the political science literature, uh, that's very consistent with the very largest companies having undue political influence. But you know, the, uh, the uh, approach we suggest would actually be more objective and more predictable than the current system of merger enforcement. The current system of merger enforcement is relatively unpredictable and amorphous due to intractable and unpredictable disputes over market definition, market power, and efficiency. By contrast, the suggestive conglomerate mergers that we predict um, Gives, gives lie to the argument that every method that incorporates politics into antitrust decision making uh, has no objectivity, uh, uh, no predictability to it. The sharp cutoffs of $10 billion for each firm would apply to every company regardless of their politics. The second objection to uh, uh, incorporating uh, anything other than economics into antitrust decision making, and in particular, um, two minutes, and and it and in particular, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and and in, and in particular, conglomerate merger legislation is that that this would destroy many efficiencies. Um, I, I'd like to start my one minute uh, uh, explanation of why that's not true with a quote from Judge Posner. I wish someone would give me some examples of mergers that have improved efficiency. There must be some. As Posner said, we reviewed the literature on efficiencies for mergers and they are few and far between. And if you take the literature on mergers in, uh, in, in different industries, they are rare beyond, beyond all measure. Uh, it seems very unlikely that a bill that would prevent conglomerate mergers would lead to any significant loss of efficiency. Uh, nevertheless, if Congress wanted to be really conservative in this area, they could raise the $10 billion thresholds to something closer to Senator Hawley's $100 billion threshold. Five years ago, I don't think too many people would have worried about these huge mergers. But uh, as Chair Khan said, now people are starting to, wa to wonder about it. And you saw her hesitation when uh, Mark said, well, how would you block a merger of these two giants? And uh, uh, she hemmed and hawed the best she could. But I think the answer is uh, there's almost no way she could have, uh, she could today block the merger that Mark uh, gave her. So in, in keeping with the theme of this conference, incorporating political considerations in antitrust and doing it well can sometimes be done. And that can be a mu another mark for antitrust in the roaring 20s. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh...
It's a real pleasure to be here. I always love coming to the University of Utah, and I'm uh, especially the law school, and I'm honored to be part of such an august panel. Um, I'm here, I think, principally to make three points, and the first is a defense of judges we've been picked on today, <laughs> and uh, about, about judges just making it up. Like, there are so few places where we can do this. Can we just have one area of the law <laughs> where we could just get to play policy? I just, I think that's my defense there. Um, second, I plan to offer a full-throated rebuttal of uh, Professor Glick's argument concerning consumer welfare theory and Marshall. Uh, third, I'll take up uh, Professor Land's argument concerning textualist re uh, reworking of the Sherman Act. Uh, I'm going to do this by drawing on my extensive background in economics and economics theory. I have none. So um, <laughs> though I did bring some charts, they're a little more sophisticated, a little more complex than Professor Lozada's, so I'll just ask your patience when we get to dead weight loss. I don't, I don't mean a word of that. I think the one thing I did understand some of those words that were said, though. So I think um, as best I understand the the, the contribution that I might be able to make as someone who's been on the federal bench for 10 years is maybe uh, a little bit of a pushback just in terms of the practical reality of uh, how this might work in the courts. And I'll, I'll say first that I'm really impressed with, uh, with this discussion. And the, uh, Professor Glick sent me some materials to review before this panel, so I'd at least have some sense of the vocabulary. And this is really, I think, important stuff. I, it strikes me as an important discussion to be having, um, and one that may be long overdue. It's an interesting, and it strikes me as novel approach to take up textualism as a way to reevaluate policy behind the Sherman Act. Um, Judges are generalists. I've, in, in 10 years on the bench, um, I have right now a, a, an MDL involving Section 1 of the Sherman Act. I, I, I was speaking with my career law clerk yesterday. I don't think we've ever touched on Section 2 of the Sherman Act, though, of course, all of us on, in the federal judiciary are becoming um, familiar with textualism. And uh, I, I'm not sure what Judge Justice Kagan meant when she uttered the phrase that we're all textless now at uh, Justice Scalia's funeral. I don't know if it was a tip of the cap to Justice Scalia, but, it, but it's true. Uh, you, uh, if you're not talking about the plain language of a statute these days as a judge and you're evaluating a statute, uh, you're going to raise some eyebrows. People are going to think that's interesting. Um, I, I was reminded, I was having an image in my mind as uh, we were hearing from the professors uh, I, this, I'm really going to reach back a little bit here. I don't know how many of you remember Monty Python. And there's the, the search for the Holy Grail. And there's the scene where King Arthur's uh, having a fight with the Dark Knight, you know, and, um, and he cuts off both the Dark Knight's arms. And he says, well, I'll still fight, you know, and I'll kick you. And I've, that, that's how it feels to me because uh, I can't begin to approach any level of expertise to these, these folks here. And I've, 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 been, I've noticed in my practice on the court, I get in trouble when we rely and depend on the adversarial process, which is missing here, um, and would inform, it would help me make a more informed criticism of Professor Land's position, if any. Um, uh, there's danger, as someone who has no background in economics or microeconomics, to wade into this area and offer some discussion about it in a written decision. But uh, it, it seems to me like the sort of thing that's worth talking about. I, I will say, reading the materials, a few, a few things occurred to me, and, and Professor Land, you mentioned this even in your definitions of monopoly, for example, and I'm, this is maybe peripheral to the point, but this is, these are the sort of things that would be illustrated in the adversarial process. But discussions of the definitions of monopoly, and I, I just wrote down, a, to say the whole of, that, fr that phrase, whole of, was mentioned several times as was exclusive possession uh, or control. Uh, one question that would come to my mind if we were having this discussion is, so what is a monopoly? I mean, so you want me to apply it how? 100, is it 100% of the market? Is it the whole of the market? Is it exclusive possession or control? There are questions, uh, and this is just one, it was a teeny little example, uh, but these are the sorts of things that we'd be vetting if we had um, 
the, at the benefit of an adversarial process. I, I hope there we get discussions like this. You also mentioned that you what you think what you're encouraging is that we overturn decades of Supreme Court jurisprudence, and you're offering good explanations for why that might make good sense. Uh, it's, you're going to have a hard time finding much of an advocate in me for that pr proposition just because I'm a lowly district court judge. I'm a trial court judge. And uh, one of the things that would be interesting is to test some of your uh, ideas in the context of a real Article Three case, case or controversy. Uh, I've already mentioned the adversarial process, but in, in reality, in a specific context, and that'd be a good place to test out whether there's room in view of the Supreme Court jurisprudence over many decades for starting to develop an argument like this and whether the right place to develop that argument would be in the trial courts. I think it probably more rightfully is in the uh, appellate courts, but um, those are just some thoughts. It, it's, uh, it's really interesting ideas. Thank you. Oh, that, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, is it pig pen in Snoopy that has the cloud like you know but I like I, that was another image that came to my mind I'm just gonna rain on the, the discussion so Bob does it have to be a hundred percent in in 30 seconds um I don't think so but I could understand a judge saying that uh, there is language possessor control control sounds like monopoly power maybe a little lower but still, that's why I focused on attempt to monopolize, not monopolize. Because even if a judge does say, you know, I really want 100 percent, well, attempt to monopolize. So this interpretation could uh, uh, help destroy monopolization as a, as a, a, a legal uh, uh, count, but could revitalize attempted monopolization. Yeah, I mean, I still think there are going to be interesting questions implicated, like uh, is the attempt, what if, what, if, what if the evidence is there's attempt to gain a 90% share of a market? Absolutely. I and worked I, on a case like, absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, they wanted to go from 40 up to 70. Their document said uh, our goal is 70. Then you're right. That would not qualify as, as an attempt. You're right. Well, my, my only point is this. As I thought about this in, in my little non-economic trained brain, uh, it just seems like it's going to be difficult to avoid policy considerations in this area. The, the bright lines are going to be hard to find. And so you're going to be relying on something. Uh, if we're in, and I, it just, I do see some, I mean, forgive me, because I, I really don't know what I'm talking <laughs> about, but I do see some tension in saying, well, read the words literally. Here's the definitions used, employ the words as they're written. And then the definitions say the whole of, an exclusive control. And, th and those are words, and they mean things too. So I, uh, it's fascinating. <laughs> See, I don't think you're Pigpen. I think you're more like Lucy, and he's trying to kick the football. Now I got to go look up those other words, right? <laughs> okay, Susan Ethy. Thanks so much, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I actually wanted to make one note as, about my introduction. I actually still am at Stanford, and I, I want to point out this really incredible program that not everyone is aware of where you know, professors can take leave from, or partial leave, it doesn't have to be full leave from their universities to do service in government, um, this IPA program. And I'll, I'll come back to how that program actually could be more fully utilized than it is today. I didn't really understand before I took the position at the Department of Justice how easy it is to, for universities to provide their professors to do public service. And I actually hope that we're gonna be able to do more of that in the future. Um, so I want to start by taking a step back um, to reflect on a lot of the benefits that society has gained in the recent decades from digitization. And that connects to my work at Stanford because especially in the last you know, eight or nine years, a lot of my time has not been in the antitrust arena at all, but rather in working to do research on and actually implement um, digital solutions for social impact. Um, I've been running a lab at Stanford where uh, we, we, we build and evaluate digital applications for 
In some of my recent research, we've shown some benefits to things like helping kids learn to read in developing countries, providing agricultural information to farmers at the time and place that's convenient for them. Um, we've developed programs to help um, women get jobs in the IT sector. Um, we're working now with Ukrainian refugees um, to, to help them find jobs. And a lot of this, the, the digitization makes this, these services lower cost, and it also allows people to consume them at the time and place that's convenient for them. And so I think actually a lot of the social possibilities are, are just starting to, to, to be realized. And we've seen in the pandemic how it's possible to bring specialized services to people in their homes. And that's especially important for people who live in rural areas or um, you know, don't have easy access to transportation, who might have full-time jobs, be taking care of kids and so on. So um, taking seriously that digitization is just this incredible opportunity for us and, and, and particularly for governments to better serve their constituencies and to serve them more efficiently. But, uh, but, but, of course, uh, part of the way that I learned personally about all of these possibilities was also in studying the, its impacts um, and some of the problems that it can create. And you know, another area of my research over the last few decades has been on something called market design, uh, which really takes very seriously the institutions of markets. The fact that, you know, and, and, and the whole uh, area of focus for that research is on optimizing those institutions. So it doesn't just say that they matter, but that they can be tweaked and that changing them changes outcomes. And it's everything about how prices are set and how information is presented, um, how people are able to express their preferences changes outcomes dramatically. Um, and that's, that, that area has gotten a couple of Nobel Prizes, including my, my advisor, my advisor's advisor, my, my colleagues. So when, when we talk about economics and say, like, what does it do? Well, one of the main things it has done since I got my PhD is to focus on the fine details of these institutions and how they matter. And then even more broadly in industrial organization, you know, multiple additional Nobel Prizes to studying things like platform economics um, and imperfect competition. That's almost all that has happened um, since I was born as an economist, you know, in the late 80s as an undergraduate and since I got my PhD in the mid-90s. So that's most of what we study. And certainly then economics is equipped to handle these things. In fact, that's the main thing we think is interesting. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still this challenge of how to apply all of this and, and map the complexity, which is all of what we do in our day jobs, into the environment of a, of a case where we have a generalist judge who's going to have to make sense out of it and, and, and interpret it. And so a lot of it is this, the mapping between these very broad guidelines and today's realities. And today's realities are more complicated. Um, we're not just seeing the traditional, you know, I make a product and somebody else makes a product and we roll them up. Or we're in a vertical supply chain, so I make an input and it's, and somebody's combining inputs and somebody else is combining those inputs and then they're going to a retailer and they're getting sold. Those types of relationships, while themselves can be complicated, they fit into a smaller number of fact patterns. And we have a lot of, of experience over the years in addressing those fact patterns. And so I would argue one of the challenges we're facing is, is that we're seeing unfamiliar or, or fact patterns that have become more common over the last few decades for a variety of reasons, which I'll go into a few examples of those. And one of the challenges is just that applying the, um, the, the economics to those different fact patterns involves complexity. And then a lot can go wrong in translating that complexity into the kind of constrained processes that we have to adjudicate decisions. And so one of the things that we're working on now is this revision of the, the merger guidelines. And one of the priorities there 
in, in doing that is to um, do a little bit of a better job of elucidating the economics that are guiding the interpretation of the statutes to make it easier to see the, the, the leap between the fact patterns we're seeing in the world and the, and the, the economics and the law. So in a, in a simple vanilla case, you know, all, the, all these, can, these things can sort of line up. Like you can understand that diminishing competition is, you know, a merger of two firms that do something similar. And, and so it's pretty easy to understand the logic of how that can go wrong. And you, and you don't need as much elucidation. And you don't, you don't necessarily even need to understand the ideas behind it because you can just apply things. If there's more steps in applying the economic ideas, it can be more important to spell those out. And so one of the things that, that can, can, can be very beneficial then is to really spell out the economic logic so that it's easier to understand a, a, a more complex application of that logic. So let me be more specific about how this is happening in the digital economy. Well, one piece of it, getting back to the market design element, is that you know, markets don't work well unless people have the right information. Um, if you're starting a business, you need consumers to learn about your products. So this kind of very textbook, simple model that we all like to make fun of is like the Econ 101. Of course, that's just Econ 101 or Econ 1, not even. Uh, it's a, the basic course. The first day of the basic course just as, assumes away all of those details. But in practice, behind the scenes, there's a lot of things that need to happen. People need to know about the products. People need to be able to make choices. They need to be able to exercise their, their, their ability to choose. If, and we can all think of, of situations in our, in our everyday life where we're making choices and we don't really understand the prices. We don't really understand the quality on the other side. And so we're not necessarily making informed choices. We can't take for granted that all of that is going to be easy. When, when digitization occurred, one interesting, like the very first knee-jerk reaction in the 1990s as e-commerce was coming online, was th this naive view that, wow, once we had computers, like search costs would disappear, and finally this, this textbook market, which had never appeared to date, would finally be realized. And there was writing in the mid-1990s about that. You know, we understood that search costs meant, well, I have to drive around to look at the prices of the gasoline stations, or I have to like go to the mall and look in the stores, and so if I, put that on a computer, well, all that would go away, and then price would equal the marginal cost, and nirvana <clears throat> would be realized, okay? And of course, similar with news, right? Finally, everybody would be able to get their information, and everybody now would be perfectly and accurately informed, okay? And so, I mean, it's, you know, obviously that isn't how things worked out. And, you know, just because information can be provided, doesn't mean it will be provided. And the incentives of the people providing that information matter. Um, and so we can't just assume that you know, free markets are going to inform everybody perfectly. And indeed, people, you know, the first, in general, the people can manipulate the process, and people have commercial incentives to manipulate that process. So we have to take that extremely seriously. And you know, it's can be almost quaint to think back to sort of the beginning of, I don't know, like tech economics antitrust in the 1990s, when you know, Microsoft was threatened by the advent of the browser and the internet, and, and you know, this application's barrier to entry um, was, was potentially threatened. That was taken seriously at the time, but if we think about that, you know, relative to today, what was the power that the PC operating system had over the economy as a whole in the 1990s? It absolutely had some power. But compared to today, the power was tiny. It wasn't getting in between us and everything we did, every decision we made from when we rolled out of bed till when we, when we 
when we turn in the evening and the phone still knows where we are while we're sleeping. Um, even might know if we got up to go to the bathroom and so on. So that, um, and even the information that was being collected, and I, I've seen this you know, behind the scenes, a lot of the information <clears throat> was not really usable because the computing infrastructure to analyze it was too expensive or to create or didn't exist. And inf information to piece things together just wasn't, wasn't being used. The algorithms weren't as sophisticated and so on. So in some sense, we anticipated a lot of things in, in the 90s that you know, were much more nascent than they are today, where you know, even our physical security or national security is impacted by all of this information, the way that it's processed and collected. <clears throat> now, so layering on to just this importance and also the changes in the way we're getting information and so on, one of the big intermediaries often are also follow business models called platforms. And so the basics of platform economics is that, you know, more buyers like more sellers or app developers want to reach users. Um, we have multi-sided markets. And in those markets, there's a lot of forces that in, in many cases, depending on the circumstance, can lend towards concentration. We have scale economies in R&D. We sometimes have direct network effects, but we very frequently have indirect network effects, more buyers, more sellers, more sellers, more buyers. And that can lead to concentration, and that can potentially be durable. We shouldn't necessarily expect that things will turn over. Let me talk for a few moments just about some of those specific economics. Um, the concentration in those markets can allow firms to serve as gatekeepers. If, if you have, for whatever reason, if a platform has exclusive access to an important set of constituents, say an important set of buyers, that's going to attract sellers on the other side. And if that important set of buyers isn't available on another platform, then you, you can't, a seller might not be able to meet their needs on another platform. So trying to find some way or another to get access to an important, get exclusive access to an important set of buyers or sellers and to keep those away from competitors becomes a really important dimension of competition. That in turn um, can lead to all sorts of issues in adjacent markets because markets adjacent to a platform might have, have something to do with how people participate across multiple platforms. Fiona Scott Morton and I recently wrote a paper called um, Platform Annexation, where we talked about a particular type of adjacent market, which are tools that help people switch between platforms, help them multi-home. And we talk about how important tools like that are to the functioning of markets. If, if consumers, if something gets in the way of consumers switching, of exercising their choice, of course markets won't work the way we, they would ideally. And particularly in an environment of indirect, of, of, of these indirect network effects or cross-side network effects, um, keeping one, if, if you can put something, you know, something at sand in the wheels of competition on one side of the market, that spills over to the other side of the market. And so that's an, also an example of you know, how I think um, these economics can, can get a little more complicated, just require a few more steps to think them through. The tool, it doesn't, it's not like a supplier that is, you know, selling in an output that's being taken as an input by another firm, but yet this adjacent market is affecting competition. And I think some of these hypotheticals about these big firms merging could be re-understood in the environment of how could something that one firm has, you know, redirect customers away from other firms or their competitors. Sure. That's, so it's, it's more than just data. I think that data is very, very important, but it's all, I like to think about it more as, as users and customers. It's, it's, it's really shifting behavior beyond just data. Now these economics, I mean, they're not that hard to understand. Hopefully at least some of you understood what I just said. But you know, if you think about trying to get that into a complaint or into an expert report, there are multiple steps. There are multiple steps to spelling that out. And that can be confusing. And so one of the things that plays, ways that academics can contribute is to sort of try to translate this, take it, there's, there's, a, there's a huge complexity of research articles. A first read of that might make you think anything could happen, and this is just hopeless. But if you actually 
put a little more work into it and narrow things down and say, well, actually, we're talking about a merger. We're not just comparing scenario A to scenario B, but firms chose to merge because they thought it was profitable to do this. That already narrows a lot of things down. Um, a lot of times, a, a, something that could be good for consumers in some cases and bad for consumers as, than others is actually just bad for consumers if the firms wanted to do it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, applying, a, put it, but it requires piecing together this logic and, and working it all the way through to understand that. And, and, it's, and that, that, I think, is an important role that, that we can play as, as academics in informing policy. So then let me um, just bring this back to an, an, another element of, of, the, of how you approach this. What an economist will do, an industrial organization economist or an economist who studies, studies business strategy, is really boil a problem down to, first let's think from a perspective of an entrant. An entrant coming in is going to have some way they could enter and compete. And often there's a limited number of strategies that really is either feasible or possible. You know, in platforms, one of them is competing in a niche and then expanding generally. Another is, you know, you find some way to get customers on one side and then you attract the other side. There is just a, a limited number of paths that, ha that, that really work economically and that have been shown to work empirically. If you then step into the shoes of a dominant firm, you can think about, well, what would you do if you could just block all of this type of firm and all of that type of firm? You kind of closed off all the paths for your dominance to be eaten away. So if you could just buy all the firms that are trying to do this and squash all the firms that are trying to do that, you're good. <laughs> and especially if there's the, one of the ways that a firm can enter is to provide a better service to one side of a market in a tech transition, because say the world changes, you have this opportunity to, to better meet the needs of consumers in a new venue. But if you buy all of those too, well, you know, we're basically just going to expect the same firms to maintain their dominance through transitions. So it's going to be really important to understand that. So coming back to the IPAs, um, one of the things and, and other tools we can use, one of the things that we're trying to do um, at the Interest Division of the Department of Justice is to expand the set of expertise that we have to bring in, you know, not just traditional IO economists and, and industry experts, but also people who understand technology. And you know, economists who, you, who have different skills, think about labor, think about platforms more specifically, um, people who understand how to analyze large data sets, and so on. And so as we expand those capabilities and, and our expertise, we may be better able to move quickly, because in some of these cases, moving quickly is important, because the only hope you have is in these moments where, where firms are young. And we also need to think holistically about and really understand the patterns of behavior that are important. So we've talked about serial acquisitions. Some scholars have talked about serial collusion. We can talk about patterns of acquisitions that could maintain and preserve dominance. And so we want to be able to recognize those patterns as they come in. So all of those are things that we're working on. Um, circling back to the merger guidelines, you know, really trying to translate for the most important fact patterns that we see to translate this economic logic, to make it clearer, to make there be less work for just pulling out the logic in a specific case so that we can really focus on the facts that are important um, for, um, for determining what's happening in this particular case. Thanks very much. We are out of time, and also we stole a little bit of your break, but that was just a transfer, you know, <laughs> and therefore you aren't injured at all. Uh, the world is better off. So we will reconvene with the next panel at 1140, and I hope you enjoy that, the efficiency that was this. <laughs>